The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. What we call in Buddhism, we have these Kalyanamitas. And uh, Kalyanamita means like a dear friend or very precious friend. And uh, I think that might be a good, good topic to, to actually today, the Kalyanamita. Um, in Buddhism, we don't really uh, believe uh, in, like inherently in a God, in a sense that the God is going to help us in a, get in, getting out of this samsara. And then in, in Buddhism, that should be always be the, our main goal. We Sure, we have mindfulness-based stress reduction all out there and all those things, and it's important. But the, the the final goal for always should be for us to get out of here. That's an it's an interesting concept. It's it's a, almost like a bit of a sounds a bit negative for us Buddhists to like that um, our goal. What are we doing? Why are we meditating? Why are we here? Why are we going to listen Dhamma talks? It's for us to keep leaning away from this world, and it's even this meta sutta we just. <laughs> Ch chanted and uh, the, it ends into the the verses of uh, not getting bored here and again, and it's um, I, I I like that verse, but it's interesting. And Ajahn Chah always uh, one the teacher in my tradition who uh, he his main his um, saying was quite often he said he likes things which have ending. He doesn't like things which always like never seem to stop anywhere. And w that's we have to remember why are we here? Why we are practicing Buddhism? Not that we get born in a happy place, we'll be happy ever after, and we don't have any mental problems, we don't have any diseases in our bodies, all those things. It just won't happen. We just go keep going back and forth in this round of samsara, and we end up. Sometimes we're in a nice place, sometimes we're not. We make the most of it, and with. With this, in this topic of Kalyanamita, it's, um, I just had an in interesting experience. I went to um, Christmas period. I was in Thailand for eight days. And the reason was, um, a lot of you know, but we are, uh, we are building the new monks' quarters in, in Newbury, which is the monastery for this uh, Buddhist Society of Victoria. And I've been sort of in charge of that, of the monk site there doing these things. And uh, somebody... Uh, kindly donated as a Buddha statue. We put this fundraising out and somebody, somebody's sister had passed away. So they, I don't know this person, so, but very grateful for that. It was a big donation. It's Buddha statues, they, these bigger ones, they tend to got quite a lot of money. So we looked around where to, where to get this Buddha statue done and we figured out Thailand is a good place. There's good, good artists and there's still a you know, big tradition of it. So we find this nice foundry and good artists and all that. It was a big big thing about it. So I went for nine, uh, eight days to Thailand just for Christmas period to make sure that the Buddha statue is up to the way we want it. We not, we as there is different, you know, Asians here and Sri Lankans and, but we wanted to have the Buddha statue made into sort of like more neutral way. Like if I, <clears throat> if you, if you go to Thailand, you see the Buddha statues, there's a very specific way of making Buddha statues. And even if I, I told the artist, this is, this is how I want the Buddha statue made. I don't, I don't, it, that we had a quite a specific Buddha statue, like a um, way we want it to be made. He couldn't help himself. He, he's so ingrained into Thai way of doing things. He incorporated the Thai things into the Buddha statue. Like it, uh, it, maybe if you can now look for Buddha statues, which are made in Thailand, but they are very elongated fingers, very fine fingers. And there's like, they, bend outside the, the Buddha statue. There's, there's just a certain way of historically way made Buddha statue. Like the Buddha statues have quite a big <coughs> pressed boobs almost. But it's just for them, it's always been beautiful to have a bit of a chested Buddha and very slim that, uh, slim line. So I, I, I went there and I said, okay, well, these are the things we have to remove. Good that we find a good artist. He was very happy to... Um, uh, go, go with all my suggestions. I didn't have any complaints or quims. At the end, he said though that the Buddha statue is maybe not. He used this word in in Thai means like a fool, like you, 
something is not complete, maybe would be a better translation. He said, uh, the Buddha statue is not complete, but you know, that's how we want, you want it, so that's how we made the Buddha statue. And I said, that's fine. We are not used to having certain looks in the Buddha statue. So, but anyways, going, that's where I, I went to Thailand. So I have few days between the, you know, when I went to the inspection the first day, I went to see the Buddha statue and said, okay, let's change this and this maybe in this way. And it's quite an interesting process, you know, like it's, it's, uh, you never, I never done anything like that. I'm sure you, most of you never done anything like that, but it's, it's very, art is very um, subjective. So it's, uh, you know, if somebody's making a statue, who am, who am me to tell them how to change things? But anyways, so I had uh, four days after the first inspection. And so I, I was thinking I could have gone to a hotel. There was a, there's a nice hotel where I actually stayed a couple of nights afterwards. But then there was, I had four days after the first inspection to go and I was like, no, hotel is not a place for a monk to stay, really. I could have easily stayed, you know, it's comfortable and all that. But as a monk, when you're in a hotel, it gets a bit claustrophobic really quick because you really don't want to leave your room. It doesn't look nice for us to go wander, sitting in the poolside, <laughs> drinking uh, orange juice there. And, you know, it's like, yeah, anyways, it's, it's not the appropriate place. So you just end up stay, spending in your room a lot of times. And so I figured, no, I go to a monastery and I know a really, really good monastery, but it's quite far from the place that we were making the Buddha statue. But I said, no, I have to, while in Thailand, if I, if I have the opportunity to meet these really good monks, good teachers, I'm going to go and meet a good teacher. So really, a um, uh, good teacher I know is Ajahn Kanha. Lumpo Kanha has been a monk for... I think this was his 50th vasa, so he's been a monk for 50 years, so that's a long time. So uh, you can imagine if somebody's been 50 years as a monk, even if they're not very diligent monk, they, they would be, you would be by then, you know, at least you would be somewhere. But Lumbo Ganha, traditionally, he was always considered very, very diligent monk when he was young. He, he went for this uh, Tudong, what in Thailand they call the Tudong, he, he was what you you go for wander and he was wandering in the, in olden days in Thailand and for many many years by himself and he was always very diligent and his he, he kept his precepts really well and the the story from Lumbo Gan, uh, Ganha was that even when he was a young monk he w he's actually a nephew of Ajahn Chah and his mother took him to see um, Ajahn Chah when he was a young quite young and he to take him actually to ordain then. And I think he's since if he's been a 50 years as a monk, he must have ordained in his early 20s because he, he's not that old yet. Because you can only ordain as a monk when you're 20, 20 years old, 20 and six months you have to be. Uh, and so uh, Lumpo Ganha ordained quite young and early on, Ajahn Chah used to always at the um, end of the Vasa, there was this thing in, in uh, Wat Papong, which is the, the headquarters of that, uh, of that tradition is that uh, when um, uh, Lumpo Ganha lived there when he was just called, you know, he, with his own name, that uh, um, is anybody enlightened? And the story was then that after the six Vasa, he said, you know, I have rid got rid of my defilements. And usually if you, if you announce something like that, if you say you don't have defilements in your mind, it's a very, very serious thing to say. Even if I say to another monk, and it's for me, it's a confessible offense. If I say to a lay person, uh, any of you, and I'm not being honest, on that second, I won't be a monk anymore. It's I, I basically, even if I would keep my robes, no other monk would consider me as a monk rest of my life. I cannot lie about any of these attainments. It's a very serious offense. But the, 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 the story coming down from the tradition for us that Lumpo Ganha, when he's after the sixth Vasa, he, he went, uh, Ajahn Chah asked, is anybody um, here got any attainments? And he said, I got, uh, I got rid of my defilements. The, that Ajahn Ganha then later, uh, Ajahn Chah later on said that, you know, uh, Ajahn uh, Ganha is, he's, uh, he's, whatever he says is right. 
So the so it, it seems to be that um, coming from the tradition side, Lumpur Kanha already had a really strong what they say Param is very good strong uh, blessings from his previous rebirths that it, when ev since he was child and you know early on his uh, you know monastic career he was able to get into deep meditation and able to get rid of his defilement in his mind, create hatred and anger delusion, so he he wasn't deluded anymore. He knew the path. So then he went, set for wandering for many years, and he's now lived in many, many years in this monastery, and it, the monastery has really grown around him, basically. It's almost when we get these famous monks where they, it's the, not just the monks grow big, but the monasteries grow big. We tend to get a bit choppy after a while, being a monk for a long time, we get fed really well. So Lumpo Kanha himself, is a, it's a, it's a, he's a great monk in many, many ways. And it was, so I decided, going back to the why, I had the four days off, so I need to go and see Lumbo Ganha. Because there's, uh, even Ajahn Brahm recognizes if there's any good monks in Thailand. Obviously, he doesn't know that much. He's been away from Thailand for a long time. But he always recognizes that Lumbo Ganha and Lumbo Liem, which is now head of our tradition after Ajahn Chah passed away, Lumbo Liem became the head of uh, Wat Papong tradition. Those are the two monks he always recognized that the monks of he knows that they're good monks. Lumpur Liam, it's, it's a bit difficult for me to go to Wat Papong. It's a, it's a very far away. I, I should have, I, I would have had to fly and flown to that, that part of uh, Thailand. And, and for him, it, it's a bit more difficult. He's very, very senior in our tradition for me to go and meet him. Anyways, there's a lot of obstructions, and I cannot just go to that forest tradition. Ajahn Kanha's monastery is it's still a forest monastery, but it's, if anybody you ever want to go there, it's still... A lot easier. That monastery has a lot of accommodation, and even for monks, they, this during the Vasa, I think I heard that they had something like 60, 65 monks there. So for me, I know now after the Vasa, they wouldn't, uh, there would be empty space. So I applied, and then they said, "Yes, please come." And of, I, of if anybody of of Ajahn Brahm has good friends, Lumbo Kanha is actually a good friend for Ajahn Brahm. So we, as a Bodhinyan monks, are, we are always welcome there. So it's a very good place for me to go. So, and Lumpo Gan has this beautiful thing. He always calls the Bodhinyana monks, we, he calls the Bodhinya, Team Bodhinyana. So I'm, I come from Team Bodhinyana. And that's somewhere how he so sometimes he feels as well, living in Bodhinyana. Ajahn Brahm is always, we are very protected by Ajahn Brahm. He, we are his sons, we are his, his monks, and he is very protective of us. He's very, he thinks of very highly of Bodhinyana monks, Ajahn Brahm, which is really uplifting for us. When somebody really always appreciates you, even if junior monk, he always says, you're so good, you know, you are... You're doing well, and it's really uplifting, and so it's a really nice to be a Bodhinyana monk. So, as a team Bodhinyana monk, so I went to Ajahn Lumpo Ganha, and and it's a it's a considered very strict uh, Thai forest monastery. Uh, in Thailand, it's a very traditional that you always you follow everything, you do everything together. You don't have free time. Sri Lanka monasteries are different. Burmese, again, they do things together. A lot of times you meditate together and all that. But the Thai first tradition, the, the tradition is that the morning bell goes off in 3 o'clock in the morning. 3.15, you have to be in the hall. So it's a, you don't have time to just lay around in the bed and rub your eyes. You just, boom, you go. You wake up, you, you hear the bell, you get up, you... you you know, basically, you just have your rope on anyway, so you just put your top rope on, keep, you take your sankati, that's the upper rope, which we rarely don't wear, but uh, in Thailand you always have to have it with you. You go to the hall, you do morning chanting, God knows how long it takes, it feels like ages, because you're not just chanting in Pali, you're chanting in, they do this alternate with Thai and Pali, so you keep going with this Thai and Pali, and so half of the chanting, I don't even know what we're doing. So I'm just sitting there, you know, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, four thirty, and then you do meditation, and then after the meditation, you do a lot of sweeping. Thai monasteries are meticulously swept. There's no leaves anywhere, but you know that's not the point. The point is you just do the work, and it's our tradition, and it's always like it's considered that. You can, you can see if it's a good monastery if the toilets are clean. 
So our, mo our monasteries, I'm being trained, same in Bodhinyana, we still continue the system and I can't get rid of that. Our toilets in Newbury are clean, meticulously clean. We're always cleaning toilets and sweeping. Those are the places in monasteries are always very clean. So you, you're cleaning, 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 sweeping, cleaning toilets, and then you go to the Pindabad, and it's a beautiful tradition. The sun starts rising in the villages in Thailand, and everybody gets together. All the monks, we walk outside of the gate. You, uh, you go into your knees, you, the, all the senior monks go first, and then you, know, you go under the row. And everybody, you know, then the junior monks stay and I go past them and, you know, everybody gets up and then we start walking to the village. And it's a beautiful sight because the sun is always rising in those times in those villages. And the villagers are always there. So very happy. They would be devastated if the monks wouldn't come. So they're so, it's so uplifting even for us monks to see all this devotion and the sweetness of the Thai people. There's so much faith in the, in the, the Sangha. They see us, you know, and it's, again, it's uplifting. You're, yes, you're practicing well. You are worthy of these gifts which are given. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing that we kept this tradition. We didn't just go to be hermits. In, we, you know, in, like that's what they do in some traditions. They just became a hermits. And, the, and it, it lost that sweetness of that where we go into the village. So the sun is rising from the you know the rice pa the paddy fields and you just walk into the village quietly, and the dogs are barking a little bit, but all that. But there's like just a little bit of noise when the end people put rice into your bowl, and it's about an hour and a half you walk into the village, and then you go back to the monastery and you continue sweeping, and then it's uh, yeah, <laughs> clean up whatever you do. Then it's the dana time, you know. People get and Ajahn Khan has made monasteries is is humongous. It's like a military camp in that. The kitchens are just, there's so much food being prepared there and all that. So then it's the lunchtime and all that. But for me, I got to spend a lot of time with Lumbo Ganha and he eats in his own kuti. So I just went for Pindabad a couple mornings. And the rest of the time in the mornings, I just, I, 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 um, I stayed in his kuti after in the morning we did the cleaning, all the, the chanting and the this meditation. I went to his kuti and that's about six o'clock in the morning. You do a little bit of cleaning there, but then Lumbo Kanha comes down and he, he, he figured out, he said, you know, Mudita, where you are you now? And I said, I'm in Melbourne now. We're starting a new monastery. So, ah, oh, you're the abbot. I said, no, 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 I'm not the abbot. I'm just helping the Buddhist. But he couldn't get, as soon as he, f you know, he heard this, he just, he was just always referring me as the abbot of the monastery. I said, no, no, I'm not the abbot. I'm just helping the build the place. But he took me underneath his wings as if, you know, like, I need to teach you now because you are now, you know, in charge of these places. And so you, I need to teach you. So it was very nice for me. I spent a lot of time from 6 o'clock in the morning. One night I was still from 6 until 11 o'clock at nighttime. I would with Ajahn Ganha. And it's a very, very rare opportunity to spend the time with this kind of Kalyanamita, which the Buddha was the original Kalyanamita for all of us. And obviously the Buddha is gone. The Buddha, the time of the Buddha said, you know, like, you know, come to me, I'm your Kalyanamita. And now we have those kind of teachers like Lumpo Ganha. For me to spend time with such a Kalyanamita, you know, precious friend, to, you know, have a, such a teacher, have so much time, it was a really great opportunity. So I was really glad I could have spent a time in the hotel sipping uh, orange juice in the poolside or go wake up, you know, just take cold showers, go and walk bare feet, sweep, you know, do all the chanting. But at the same time, I get the time to spend somebody like, you know, a teacher which has been a rose for 50 years and who's really a nice teacher. So it was, it was such, a, I was so happy after that four days there that I was, I had so much energy that even though, you know, you sleep minimal, you, you, at the night time, even like 11 o'clock at night time, I remember being awake since three o'clock in the morning, I had so much energy that I barely could go to sleep. So it's amazing. And so I, I, I spent a lot of time with Lumpo in those days and it reminded me, um, our tradition of the Thai forest tradition started with um, Ajahn Man. And Ajahn Man was, you know, he, there was this kind of movement at the time that was about, it's more than 100 years ago now. 
But so he turned away from the city tradition. There's, the, there's ebb and flow in all of our traditions. Monks, you know, they become comfortable living in the cities, being close to the lay people and all that. Ajahn Man saw that uh, the Buddhism in Thailand had gone too much into the tradition of just studying, and he turned his back into it um, quite a bit in, in when he started meditating. And he took off and he went into these two dongs around e- everywhere in Thailand. He stayed in the really for, uh, forest tradition, uh, forest forested areas, and just meditated hard. And Ajahn Chah who again is the you know the teacher from my tradition he only saw Ajahn Lumpo Man uh, for two days I think he saw him but he always considered Lumpo Man as his teacher who who taught him the most who he respected really the most and he only saw him two days so that it reminded me that that story reminded me of me now seeing Ajahn Kanha that I was always remember these few days of really with kind heart, with with a lot of gratitude that I could meet these kind of teachers and they're still alive in my time. And I can go and talk to them and they give a lot of time to you, a lot of kindness. So it, it was a really nice reminder for me. It's like, oh yeah, there is still monks out there who have practiced well, who are worthy of the, the respect and who can actually help you in the path. And so I felt that after, after only... Uh, three nights and four days I think I spent there the fourth day I already left that it was really worth it and so it, the the time the time when you spend with these kind of monks it's it's a bit scary I must admit in the beginning I've, I met Lumbo before but this time I never got to spend so much time with him where he, I was with him like we he took me we went for a ride in the monastery he showed me the compound we were like many hours driving around and he just kept uh, talking to me and obviously I don't speak Thai and so I had the translator with me all the time so he's he his practice is to give and he always keeps re, re, you know reminding me as well like Mudito you have to give and this is what what monks we what we give we give to teach we give time to the other monks and lay people and all that and that's what he's he's really representing that he is giving himself from the morning. He says, I wake up in the morning and as he thinks first thing in the morning, what can I give? Not, not what I can get from this life, from what I can get from, from the universe. What, I can, you know, how, what, what do I get today? No, what I can give. And that is really why he gets his happiness. He gives, gives, gives. He's never thinking of himself. He's, well, he's always giving to others. And he's... You can see he's so peaceful and so kind and there's this lo- effortless loving kindness coming out of him because he's just thinking of giving, not what I get out of this. So it, it was, he kept reminding him, Mundito, now you're in a, now you're the abbot. <laughs> now you're, the, now you're in a, you know, you're starting to be in a place of responsibility. You have to give. You keep giving. Don't think about anything, you know, like anything, what you get out of it. It doesn't matter. You just give. And it, and it's a, it was a really nice reminder of that. But going back to the uh, the scary part, the scary part is somebody like Lumbo Ganda is they say that he can read your mind. And it, once you're with him, it starts to be a bit obvious that yes, there is something to that. And so it's a bit scary if you're not perfectly enlightened yet. So you can imagine that for me, a person like me, it might be a bit nerving to be uh, some, with somebody like that. In like many, many hours, you're in the car with him, and he said, Murito, do you understand? And he's always like, do you understand? I say, yes, yes, yes. So he, he told me things like, Murito, don't be like the city monks. In Thailand, it's a bit of a, it's not really, it's considered that if, you, if you're just doing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of activities with lay people, or you're starting to be like a lay person. If you, the, the other monks call you, the forest monks call you the city monk. He said, don't be like the city monks. Don't use the mobile phone. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's not good. Uh, so he said, you know, if you need something done, get lay people to do it for you. They will happily help you. Don't start, 
you know, of going, cutting corners. I just do it this myself. And then, you know, other people don't have to worry about it. He said, don't worry, you know, lay people will help you. So I was, it was, and he kept reminding you, keep your seal, like, keep your seal, like, keep your precepts. And I said, I, I said, oh, Lumpo, I, you know, I think I'm pretty good with my, my precepts. But he said, no, 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 Mudito, keep your sila. And, and, you know, then you start looking into your mind, like, what have I done? <laughs> Why is he repeating this, keep your sila? And there's like, keep your mobile phone away. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> there's something to this. And I've noticed, I must admit, I mean, I don't want to be, you know, hiding things. I, I, it is really addictive. All of us, we know. I didn't have mobile phone for nine years, and this smartphone just came. I've been in monastery now for a decade. I, they didn't exist when I went to the monastery. And now that I, last year I came to Newbury, and, you know, I was given a phone. You know, it's partly I need it for the, for the project, but do I need it that much? I don't know. I mean, it's, it is so addictive. It's... I can look at all the Dhamma talks in, into the YouTube, but do I always look at the Dhamma talks? I'm not sure. It's, <laughs> do I need to? Ajahn Khan has, you know, he's a really good because he says, you can study the world, but it's never going to end. And he's absolutely right. The world, the study of the world is never going to end. No matter what I study in the world, oh, that's interesting. I should know this. But do I really? Do I? Like Ajahn Kanha, he has probably, he really, he doesn't read new, newspapers. He's probably never really read newspapers all of his life. He doesn't know anything really. He went to school for four days, four days, four years, sorry. Four days would be a bit short. Four years he went to the village school in, you know, northeast of Thailand. And, you know, in those days, probably four years, you, you would get way more information in four years. These days, if you would, four years of school. He went to four years in the village school in northeast Thailand you know, uh, more than 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And that's his education. He's never read, he doesn't read newspapers. He never probably read newspapers. He doesn't know anything about the world. But yet, he is somebody who knows your mind. He knows his mind. And because even you know he can just look into that, and it just, it doesn't feel like, you know, with the mind reading, it doesn't feel like you know he's probing into your mind. There's just this talk coming out of him. It's not like it comes out of his thinking mind. You know how we we talk most of the time. We there is our talk is mixed with our emotion. How do you feel at the moment? It's mixed with your thinking. All this past and you know future things come into the way you behave and it affects your thinking for him it seems to just come out of him and he comes and he doesn't feel guilty about saying sometimes he's quite direct about certain even even certain monks in our tradition and I was quite shocked that he openly talks about it I don't want to say here it's not very nice for me to because I, I might re, you know misinterpret how what he says but it, it seems to just come out of him and he, there is no e emotions mixed with it. The, if, there, if there's anything, there's just compassion. He was just trying to help me. He wasn't saying, Mudito, don't you look YouTube videos. He said, you know, he just said, you know, it just comes to, you know, it's like, keep your sila. He's, it's all, he's guiding you in the path. And he's so, he's so inspiring. He just said, he just pushes you along very effortlessly. And there is no, he doesn't try to put you down or make himself look higher. It just comes out of him. Whatever he, there is this, whatever he gets the feeling of he, uh, he, how can he help you in the path. That's what he's doing. He's not trying to put you down. And quite often when you're putting other people down, you put yourself up. He's not putting himself in pedestal. It's amazing, like most of us, we do that. Quite often we, there's this kind of back... In, you know, thinking in the back, maybe not even thinking, but somehow we are used to making ourselves look in better, in nicer light than we actually should be. Maybe not so, it's not so bad, but if we're aiming towards talking from compassion, loving kindness, it comes from a different place. So we need to all practice that way. So to me, this kind of Kalyanamita, it's so important so I really encourage any, any of you, I, I mean, it's, it's great, you come and see monks here, the nuns here, Ajahn uh, Nisarno's here to help you now, the path, and he's, he's been here, you know, 
now a lot longer than I have, and I'm walking in these footsteps, and you're supporting me, and I try to. So it's we have this nice tradition we, in this Theravada tradition where we keep supporting each other. We are each other's Kalyanamitas, and try to remember that you have the responsibility yourself. You have the responsibility of helping others in this path. Once you start getting somewhere, you have to give. If you feel down, if you feel you don't have self-confidence, how do you get self-confidence? Is you give. You keep helping. That builds up your self-confidence. You feel good about yourself. You've been giving. Then you don't worry about, do I feel good about myself? You don't f worry about so much about self-confidence because you've been giving from the best of your ability. And you, you, you have metta, compassion, mudita. You, ha you feel that you, know, you feel good about others. They're doing well. So you, that upslifts your mind. And you, so best of your ability, and it increases your happiness, it increases your, if you have any kind of depression. I was just listening to Dalai Lama just shortly, there was this little clip on YouTube, and I don't, see, I don't usually listen, I, I try to stick with, you know, Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Pramali, my teachers, and um, very, because it's very confusing when you listen to many teachers. But I just, I saw this little bit clip about, about from Dalai Lama, and somebody asked him, it was an Indian girl, asked him about depression, why do we get depressed? And uh, one of the, the, the key points that Dalai Lama was pointing, that's because you believe into the reality, you believe into your thoughts. You, th you think what you see outside is correct. It's only correct in your mind. You are creating this reality. You see the reality through your own classes, and when you see something, seeing, you experience it, and it comes into your life, and you believe into it, this is how it works. So you believe into your depression. You believe that this is how it, I cannot get out of it. There's nowhere, you cannot see the future. It becomes your reality. Depression is now your reality. What if you believe the other way? What if you saw the reality differently? Is it, dif if, is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's the same reality, but we are trying to change our perception. That's what we're trying to do here. And then we're leaning towards Nibbana, towards obviously when we are get our changing our you know, perceptions slowly, slowly. And it has to come from a place of kindness. It has to come from a place of where you, we are trying to see the reality, not in the negative way where everything is sort of bleak, it's not going anywhere. It comes from a place of compassion. And that's where we get, we see these people, obviously we don't, we don't see the Buddha anymore, but he, he was the Kalyanamita, he was the one with having a lot of compassion in the beginning. And we kept the ball rolling, and now we are here where we have to practice that, and we are changing our perceptions. Now we are the people at this time and time and age. We are the ones now who are doing our best of abilities, changing our perceptions, leaning towards Nibbana, finding the happiness in this world, changing our perceptions. And the way to do it, you find these Kalyanamitas, you go to the retreats, you come to the listen to the Dhamma talks, Put your effort yourself. And it, it doesn't come from these hours of sitting. I don't like the idea anymore that the more your hours you put into the you know sitting, somehow that's going to change you. It's not the magical pill. It, the, if you don't have the foundation, actually this Ajahn Lumpur Ganha told me this, if you don't have the foundation of when you're giving from the giving and, and, and metta, the foundation is not there. You're just sitting there and you, you, you're stewing on your own brew, which is not very pleasant. It's not, it doesn't come from a place of giving. Give yourself to the meditation. Give yourself to the path and it will work. It is no other way. It will lead you towards happier place. But we just have to give ourselves into this practice. 
It's not that you go there and you sit down and obviously uh, 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 some kind of magically it's going to change you. No matter how much you study the suttas, you know, you know, you know all the formulas, you know even the Abhidhamma. As if that's going to, if that brings you happiness and motivation, that's good. But it's not, all that knowledge doesn't take you anywhere if you don't have a heart which is soft and gentle. If you don't have somebody who's, who you met people, monks, nuns, lay people as well. If you don't meet these people, you don't see these, you don't see the Dhamma in action. You can just see the, you know, the dead books which come from two and a half thousand years ago. If you don't practice, it doesn't, it doesn't lead you anywhere. So give yourself to the tradition uh, for the practice. See the Kal- see the Kalyanamitas. Go and find them. Ajahn Pramali will be coming here th- soon to do the retreat. Very good Kalyanamita. He's, I definitely respect him very very highly. He's you know I can see him as my my great teacher. I've lived with Ajahn Pramali a long time now. He knows his suttas. He knows his Pali. So if you want to come and listen, somebody's good. Please come for that for the retreat here in Melbourne. Go meet Ajahn Brahm in Perth, you know, do the retreats in China Grove. We have a beautiful retreat center. Support us in Newbury. Uh, give your money to us. No, I'm just joking. Please. <laughs> it, it still helps. We, you know, we are now going to start building our retreat center. So we are going in the right direction in, in Newbury as well. So there will be great monks coming there. We have other places here in, in Victoria as well. You know them and you find good teachers. But... We are, we are in a tradition where you can find the Dhamma in English. We're not in a cultural Buddhist where you, you, know, you have to sort of sieve through what's, what's the Dhamma and this and that. Find teachers like Ajahn Brahma, Ajahn Pramali, who have done the you know, legwork for you, have sieved through the suttas, who know them in and out. And fi- yeah. So I think I was going for quite a while it was um but it's so nice to be here and it's so nice to be supported by all your view and i hope i give you something for today to reflect and i can have some questions if needed can everyone hear me yes (laughs) um is it ajan um mudita two more years and i'll be (laughs) Bhante, thank you so much. I actually feel fired up. I'm sure many of us do after that talk mm. to practice and contribute. You know, um, you mentioned about the internet. I totally understand that. No. The internet can be a trap. You, information, news, and you can get lost in all these rabbit holes. But I just wanted to also put in a good word. It's really over the last five years of finding that all the suttas are there and yeah. then translations are there, and yeah. then they're explained by great teachers that I've learned more in these last five years or from the internet than I did in the previous 20. Mm. I just wanted to mention that the internet mm. is also a fountain of information Correct. if we look in the right places. I just want to put in good word for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> if, what do you think of that? Though? Yeah, you yeah, know, it's absolutely right. Absolutely right. You're right, and that's, you know, you'll find... That's why Dhamma is so available these days. I mean, um, we have great things like Banda Suchado is doing the Sutta Central now, and... Um, so anybody, if you want to find good translations and good su- uh, suttas, well f- versed, and um, Bande Suchado's translations are freely available in Sutta Central, and there's a lot of out there, a lot of comparative studies b- done by Bande Suchado, Ajahn Pramali, uh, Ajahn uh, Bante Analio from you know University of Hamburg. We we know a lot of things which. You know whether they are original suttas or not. So we, there's a lot more. You know we can have a lot more trust into the suttas, whether they are what's original, what's not. There's so much great things happening these days. Where it was until now we almost like we just preserved things. So we have we have a lot of gratitude for that that we preserved all those suttas. But now we are starting to be more uh, not just faith based. We we just trying to find. What is the actual, you know, there's, somebody's doing the civ work, what I, like I said. Yeah, that's true. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very helpful. Um, yeah. I have a question in regards to, um, as people sometimes will go through life and sometimes being a wholesome person or doing certain practices can be quite challenging. Um, so my question is in regards to, for example, 
Um, do you have any wisdom or any practices that can help people develop maybe um, more willpower or motivation? Um, anything? Willpower or what? Or sort of like motivation to... Motivation, oh yeah. Because sometimes we, as people, we might, like you were mentioning the story, like sometimes in the morning, like let's say a person is struggling to get up, to do a practice or something like mm. that. Um, is there any um, so, sort of suggestions or wisdom you can give in regards to how a person can develop maybe the right view or develop the right motivation in life to get motivated? I'm not sure if I'm wording you correctly. No, that's right. Um, yeah. yeah. It's good. Do you have any thoughts on that or anything to yeah, come uh, to you? Yeah. The, the the will willpower is a bit of a like a, a w word in in these circles, which is like uh, <laughs> it's the will doesn't belong to you. Have to remember that. So uh, it belongs to your mom usually. At least for me, it, it, it's usually mom knows way better. I, I, every time I call my mom, it's like my mom has has my will. Luckily, no, luckily I spent enough time now with Ajahn Pram, so Ajahn Pram has my will. Um, uh, motivation is good. It's, it's, we might have to remember you have to have it, different things in your arsenal. I have like a tool bag. It, it, sometimes we just emphasize meta with loving kindness, which is very important, you know, and you start from yourself, have, you know, have compassion, kindness towards yourself, and like, I'm all right. You know what? I have to take care of myself. Nobody else is going to do it for me. It's, you know, it's a very important practice, and we, that's why we emphasize it. But it's, it's a one thing in the toolbox. That's going to motivate you, hopefully. Uh, read this, you know, contemplate things like anatta, you know, non-self. It doesn't, none of this, your will doesn't belong to you. Your body doesn't belong to you. None of this is yours. Your mind is not yours. It's just causes and conditions. So it's just like, just give yourself a break. Have, you know, that's a, contemplation is actually a good thing. That's, a, that's why uh, would, you have to have different tools, but you have to have this kind of attitude, which is you contemplate, you see through the, uh, according to the Buddhist teaching, well, obviously because we're, you know, like being a monk and all that, I'm, we, we emphasize on the Buddhist teaching, try to understand the basic Buddhist, Buddhist teachings. And you contemplate those, and it brings the motivation in the mind. This should be a happy path. We always forget. forget. Buddhism should be a happy path. It, you know, we, we have the noble truth of everything is suffering, but we forget this should be a leading us away from the suffering. This is the ending of the suffering. And the more you end the suffering, the more happy you become, the further you are in the path. So, okay, so motivate, you know, like have metta, have compassion toward, towards yourself, and then it flows out towards the world and others. And um, I, I don't have so many others, you know, it's a good, maybe I give the next talk here in a few months' time when I'm going to be here, so that's a good topic, but um, the, just remember, just read the suttas, listen to other teachers, and remember you have to have different tools because they just sort of go plant after a while. You use metta or use uh, anicca, this impermanent thing, for a long time. It sort of becomes plant. So you have to keep keep at it. Keep you, you know, it got the motivation. You just changes in different times of your life or different, you know. So you have to keep at it. But um, I'll keep that in mind. I'll maybe, uh, you know, give a talk on it. But metta is always good. But yeah. No worries. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, John. Thank you for your wisdom. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, if you had any thoughts or suggestions on how you would uh, overcome kind of a desire to keep reading the news and maybe get emotionally mm. caught up in it. Because I find that sometimes I fall into those traps yeah. of reading something and yeah. then thinking, oh, like, you know, I'm not being responsible enough in yeah. terms of creating a impact or difference. I, I know. Guess. Same like now with the bushfires. I think a lot of well, everybody feels, you know, that, we, you know, if there's more I could do, what could I do and all that. And I, we've done things now, actually, I think Buddhist Society is doing something. The fundraising, we have the fundraising box, so, you know, you give yourself for the fundraising, yeah, and your wallet, right. Um, 
So um, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the thing is, uh, you have to realize what sells the news is the negativity. There is no news now with bushfires because the 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 sort of the interest has died down, died down now. So now we moved into another negativity n thing, which is interesting, which is the I don't know the Iran, the conflict. How can I help about that? You have to set the limit of yourself. This is like how much can you actually make an impact into this world? How much is how much these news are affecting you? Do you really need to know? I, it was the same. I was kept reading about the the bushfires now, and it's I, it, it's it brings you down. There's only so much I can do for this, except change yourself. The only thing I remember, Ajahn Brahm has this thing where it was actually the time of the war in Vietnam when he was in um, Wat Pa Nanacha, when he was early young monk Ajahn Brahm, and they they wanted to do something because. You know, Vietnam is just there. They saw sometimes the planes go over, and they went to see the Ajahn Chah, and they said, "What? What can I do? What can we do? What, we should do something." And Ajahn Chah told them, first, help yourself. If you don't help yourself first, you don't know how to help others." And who talks about war in Vietnam anymore? It was a massive thing at the time. People were drafted. <laughs> So many people, lives were lost. Not really, and what was the cause? You know, the West, we were fighting the, the fear of communism. Did it ever happen? Did it really matter that we, so much effort and war, uh, blood was lost for that? Sometimes we have to have a bigger perspective. Sure, it is important now that we help the bushfire victims, we have fundraising and all that. You give for those things, and you, you know, you give from your kindness of your heart, but the really, it's better to limit ourselves. And like I said, like Lumpur Ganha says, this, it's never ending. To study the world is never going to end. We are aiming to end this whatever we have. We are aim, aim, our aim should be to end our lives, sort of, to speak, our rebirths. We're not aiming to you know, to study the world more and more, because it's never going to end. We, you, we help to the best of our abilities, like the bushfire victims now. We give water, money, whatever is needed, and, but you have to give them what they need. And it's so, that's, you have to start reflecting with, with, with wisdom. Mindfulness and wisdom always go in hand in hand, and that's the teaching of Ajahn Brahm always emphasized. You have to be aware of it, and you have to be aware of it with wisdom. How much can I do? And is it going to help me? Help yourself first, and then you come from the right place. Thank you. What time to lunch starts? Okay, one more. We have to keep it short, otherwise the food gets cold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess a lot of us get a little bit caught up in the notion that we're um, the, the earth that the young ones are inheriting, those who we've, you know, produced, our children, our grandchildren, is perhaps um, in a very bad way because of us. I see that as a slightly different problem for us. Uh, do you have any comment? I guess I'm talking about climate change. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. It, that, yeah, that's a big problem. Um, who I think Ajahn Brahm gave recently a good talk about it. I think, or was it Ajahn Pramali? Uh, I, I saw it, but I forgot, you know, the, the thing is, I know, it is, because it's always like, it's, yeah, well, I, I don't really worry about myself, but it's uh, children and all the others and the animals and all that. It's, it's true. Yeah, and that, that is, it is a sad to see those things in, in there. Um, it's not we we are not turning away from the problem, but sometimes it's it's helpful to think about what if we solve the problem and you look back. So you have to think outside of the box. So that that's what meditation would help and all that. You know, you see it from okay, now the problem is solved, and you look back and how we solve the problem. Sometimes you you know the. We have, in, in the Buddhist teaching is, 
the world is on fire. And it's one of the, one of the suttas we, we chant every, during the every rains retreat. We have certain suttas. We, and, you know, Aditsa Pariyaya Sutta. You know, everything is on fire. That's a good translation for Aditha Pariyaya. What is on fire? It's on fire with your defilements. End your defilements. Then the world will be a cooler place. End your hatred. Your greed. End those, and we can solve the climate change. <laughs> Once your greed is out, we'll be way better. So remember the Buddha's teachings are, are there, and you know, so we just go with that. Yeah. Sad, sad. Okay, let's see. <laughs>